Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Category theory is often used to connect two different branches of mathematics. What's rather interesting is that actually you can use category theory to study category theory itself. And that's because there's actually a category of categories. And that's what I want to have a look at in this video here. Okay, so let me describe for you this category of categories, which is denoted this cat underline. As usual, I have to tell you what the objects are and what the HOMs are. Okay, the objects, as usual, by the name of this category, are just categories themselves. Okay, and what are the HOMs? So the HOMs, so if you're given two categories, you can talk about functors between them. Okay, so the HOMs between two categories are just the functors between them. Okay, so let's just see how the axioms are. Uh, are given okay so firstly we need to have an identity okay an identity home okay so suppose you're given some category c here we actually have an identity functor let's see how that works okay so suppose your category c is here we want a functor from c to c okay it's the identity so as you would expect what does it do on objects nothing it sends an object c to an object c it also has to operate on the homes here so suppose you have a home from this object c to this object C prime, this HOM F, okay? So if you apply this identity function to it, you should get the identity of F, which goes from identity of C to identity of C prime. Okay, so what is identity of C? Of course, the identity of, doesn't do anything, so this is just C here. Similarly, this identity of C prime is just C prime here. Okay, so we need uh, basically uh, to give a HOM from C to C prime, and the input to create that is this HOM here, F. And of course, we just let that equal F. Okay, so the identity of F is just F itself. So really, it just sends an object back to itself and a HOM back to itself. That's all it does. And that's the identity functor. Okay, the other piece of data that you need to uh, describe a category is you need the composition. Of homs, okay. So how do we compose? In this case, the homs are functors. So how do we compose functors? Okay. So suppose we're given two functors here. So here, by the way, I should state the functors here are covariant functors. Okay. So the functors here uh, are say f from c to d and g from d to e here. And we, what we want to do is we want to look at a new functor g f, which goes from c to e. Okay. So again, we define it on objects and on homs. And it will be pretty clear how you can define it, uh, the uh, that it respects the axioms of being a functor. Okay, so let's just see what's going on here. So on objects, suppose you have an object C inside here. What can you do? You want to say what's G F of C? Well, you can apply F to this C, and that gives you an object of D. And since there's an object of D here now, F of C, you can apply G to that to get G of F of C. And that is GF of C. That's the object there. What about HOMs? Okay, so let's look at the HOMs. Suppose you're given a HOM inside this domain category from C to C prime. That's F. <coughs> what you can do is you can apply this first one to F so you get a HOM in D. Okay, that goes from FC to FC prime. That's F of F. So now this is a HOM inside D, so you can apply G to it to get G of FC to g of f of c prime and that's g of f of f okay so where does this go well this by definition this composite is just gf of c and this by definition for the objects is just gf of c prime so this will be a home from here to here so we can use this as the definition of gf of f okay so gf of f is really just composed you apply f to this home first and then g to this home inside d and that gives you how gf acts on these homes and you can check that this is functorial so it preserves the identity it also preserves uh, composition okay so identity here f makes the identity here to here and then g maps the identity here to here so of course the composite by this thing here sends the identity to the identity and similarly for composition so the axioms hold and in that way we've defined now a category of categories Okay, so let's see what we can do. So remember, once you have the notion of a category, we can talk about isomorphisms in that category. So in particular, we can talk about the notion of isomorphism in the category of categories, okay? So let's just unravel what that definition says, okay? So basically, an isomorphism is something where you have an inverse morphism, okay? So an isomorphism of categories is, well, uh, what is a hum, okay? It's a functor, so it's a functor, say, f from c to d. 
such that there is an inverse hom or an inverse functor. So that's g from d to c. And what does it mean to be an inverse functor? So remember, there's this identity functor here. So it's the two composites equal the identity. Okay, so fg is going to be the identity functor uh, from d to d. And gf, so you do f first and then g, is going to be the identity functor on c. Okay. And as usual, in this case, we say the two categories, C and D, are isomorphic. Okay, so remember, usually when you have mathematical objects and they're isomorphic, they're in many ways uh, things which are more or less the same. You can treat them in the same way, okay, up to a certain extent, and to what extent that's true is this notion precisely of isomorphism. So it's a categorical thing, okay? So let's just see, what does it mean when we say two categories are, are um, isomorphic, okay? What's the import of that? Okay, and this proposition tells us exactly what's going on here. Okay, so suppose f is a, a functor from c to d, and there, that's an inverse functor to g from d to c. So these two are inverse functors. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, so basically that means that c and d they're morally essentially the same category. Okay, so what does that mean? So what's a category? Well, it has objects and it homes. So part a tells you about the objects. The objects of d, what are they? They're essentially the objects of c. In what sense? Every object of D has the form FC for some C, an object of uh, the category C. Okay, so what about the HOMs? The HOMs inside the category D. Well, the objects have the form FC and FC prime, okay, so they're two general objects inside the category D, okay. So what are the HOMs here? Okay, well, the thing is that they're, they're mirrored by the HOMs inside C. This is precisely equal to the HOMs in C, the category C, of C to C prime. Actually, we write this as equals, but they're not actually equals as home sets. Uh, there's a canonical bijection, which we'll see in the proof. Okay, so let's prove that, and it's easy enough to see how that works, okay? Um, but it's fairly illustrative as well. Okay, so what we want to show is that every object of D, you can write as FC. Okay, and it's in fact uniquely written in that form, and uh, I won't prove that, I'll just prove the statement of part A here. So suppose you have an object of D, of course, by our definition of the identity functor here, okay, D is just the identity of D. D is equal to the identity functor inside the category D applied to D. Now, of course, we have inverse functors F and G, so the composite FG is equal to the identity on D. Okay, so this is F of G of D. And what's FG of D? Remember, this is just, you compose F of G of D. Uh, it's inside here, right? Uh, so I've composed them the other way here, but FG D is f of g of d. So if I write g of d as c, then uh, that allows me to express d as f of c. Okay, that's all there is to the proof. Okay, so let's do the second part. Okay, so now I want to find canonical bijections between these two HOM sets here. So we'll look at this side first. C, the HOMs uh, in c from c to c prime. Okay, so remember when you apply a functor to it, you can apply functors to the objects and also to the homes. Okay, so we're going to apply it to this home set, and what it does is it sends me to this home set here, the homes from FC to FC prime, and of course they're the homes inside the category D. And then what can you do? Okay, so we want to have inverse bijection, so you want to say that this is actually the bijection which gives you the equality here. Okay, so what's the inverse bijection? Well, of course, we use the inverse functor. Okay, we use the function f here, so we'll use the inverse functor here. So we apply g to this. So what happens when we apply the g to this? Now g goes back from d to c, so you get homs inside c. And it goes from g f of c to g f of c prime over here. Now of course g f, right, they're inverse functors. So that means that uh, g f is the identity functor on c. So you just get c here. And similarly you get here c prime. So this is the homs from C to C prime. The same as this HOM set here. This HOM set here is the same as this HOM set here. And you can check since F and G are inverse functors that of course that when you do this composite you just get the identity on here. Okay. And similarly you can um, uh, compose this with F and you can show that uh, actually you'll get a, a bijection. Okay. And that completes the proof of this proposition here. Okay. So that's rather nice, okay? If you have an isomorphism of categories, they really tell you uh, about each other, okay? They're very strongly related in this way, okay? Basically, the objects match up precisely like this, okay? And the homs match up in this sense here. We have a canonical bijection like this. 
So unfortunately, uh, this story is too good to be true to use a lot very often, okay? So this notion of isomorphism categories is actually too restrictive in general, okay? So it turns out that um, the point is this one here. Usually it's too good to be true that you expect with two different categories like this that every object actually equals f of c, okay? Uh, for some uh, c inside here, okay? Usually you only get it to be isomorphic to something like that, okay? So uh, fortunately there's going to be a more general notion that I'll have a look at in the next video called the notion of an equivalence of categories. Now isomorphisms of categories are fairly rare but I do want to give you one example and to motivate this example here I want to uh, give you two uh, statements that you might have heard in a modules course. Okay? So the first one is a z-module is just an abelian group. In fact, sometimes that's also stated a bit more forcefully as the theory of Z-modules is the same as the theory of abelian groups. Of course, these statements are imprecise, and now we can give precise uh, statements of what's really meant by them. Okay? The precise statement is encoded in this proposition here, and it just says that the category of Z-modules and the category of abelian groups are actually isomorphic. Okay? So that's a precise statement of what you might have informally heard elsewhere. Okay, so let's see why this is true. As usual, to say they're isomorphic, we just need to have inverse homs, or in this case, inverse functors. Okay, so let's have a look at the functor going from Z modules to abelian groups. Z modules to abelian groups, and we'll denote it F, that's commonly what it's denoted by, because it's called the forgetful functor. Okay, so what's the forgetful functor? Okay, so we have to define this functor on objects and on homs. So let's start with the objects, which are Z modules. Okay. But what is a Z-module? A Z-module is just an abelian group with a scalar multiplication by elements of Z, by integers. Okay? So what you can do is you can forget the scalar multiplication and just look at the additive structure there. Okay? That's called the underlying abelian group. Okay? So that's Fn. That's how we'll define this forgetful function F on objects here. The other thing that we have to define is what it does to Homs. So suppose you have a z-linear map from m to m prime, where m and m prime are z-modules. That's our home f, okay? Well, of course, in particular, it has to preserve addition. So it's a group homomorphism from the underlying group of m to the underlying group of m prime. So you can just define f of this little f, this home f, to be that same f, okay? It's the same function. It's the same function. But we're just noting seeing that because it's z-linear, in particular, it's going to be a group homomorphism. So uh, it's illegal to make this definition. Okay, then the first thing to note, and that's an easy exercise, is that f is indeed a functor. Okay, that's quite easy to see. Of course, what does it do to the identity? Okay, um, the identity stays as the identity, as an identity map, in fact, okay, which is also the identity in both these categories. And then uh, what does it do to composition? Well, it hasn't really changed the function at all. So since composition inside these categories is just composition of functors, okay, it does actually preserve composition. And that's that exercise. And that constructs one of the inverse functors. Now we go in the opposite direction, which is a little bit harder. Okay, So we'll construct the inverse functor G from the category of abelian groups to the category of Z modules. And how do we do that? Okay, well, we'll start with the objects first. Okay, so suppose we're just given an abelian group. Okay, so what's a Z module? It's an abelian group plus the, the data of a scalar multiplication which satisfies certain axioms for being a module. Well, I claim there's a unique scalar multiplication, okay, by uh, integers on this abelian group which makes it a Z module. Okay, so you can enrich that abelian group with the scalar multiplication to make it a Z module. Okay, so if you haven't seen how this works, then it's best just to do a little bit of an example. So, and then you can abstract from here what that Z module structure is. Okay, so for example, you need to know if you're given an abelian group A here, how to multiply it by 3. But of course, you should know uh, if you have an abelian group, it's easy enough to multiply by 3. That makes sense because you can add it to itself three times. Okay, so you have three copies itself and you add it together with two additions. And that's three times a. That's the natural one, and that would uh, uh, give you the correct thing. What about minus two times a? Okay, minus two. Well, you have negatives two. So now you can uh, multiply this by two using this rule, or just add negative a to itself. Okay. And similarly, you can define multiplication by any integer. And of course, it's not hard to see that if you do that 
you will actually get a Z module. Okay, so uh, we've enriched this abelian group by coming up with a scalar multiplication here, which makes that uh, abelian group a Z module. And of course, what's the underlying abelian group here? The underlying abelian group is just this A here. If you forget the scalar multiplication, you get back this A, which is suggesting that this is an inverse functor to what's going on here. Okay, so let's see what it does on homs. Okay, suppose you have a group homomorphism A to B, so that's a hom inside here. You need a Z linear map over here, okay? And it's a Z linear map on uh, G of A to G of B, okay? So with this scalar multiplication. Well, of course, so you need a function from here to here, okay? So G of A is just this A with this enriched uh, scalar multiplication, and G of B is just uh, the abelian group B as a set. It's the same as B, okay? Well, I'll just make it the same function. And the point is that, well, F preserves addition, so of course it preserves this scalar multiplication of, as well. So it preserves multiplication by 3. So if you have uh, 3 copies of A and you add them all together, of course, where we'll get sent, so that's multiplication with 3, it will be 3 copies of F of A and you add them all together. Okay, so that sends to, goes to 3 times F of A. So it preserves scalar multiplication as well. So it's automatically Z-linear, and so that means you can define GF equal to F. And similarly, we can see that, uh, of course, G is actually a functor. That's not too difficult to show. It preserves the identity and it preserves composition. And also, these are inverse functors. Okay, so we've seen a little bit of that already. But yeah, if you compose these two, you get the identity functor. Okay, so for example, um, let's just see what it does to the homs. Okay, well here, what it does to the homs, remember, uh, at the end of the day, the homs in this category, all this category, are just functions. And what it does to these functions is nothing, neither the f nor the g. So if you apply f to it and then g to it, of course, it hasn't changed it because neither f nor g has changed them as functions. Okay, But you're just viewing them as functions sometimes inside the category of Z modules and sometimes in the category of abelian groups. So at the end of the day, you haven't changed what that function is, so it's the identity on the homes. And similarly, you can see that, that the identity on the objects as well. And in that way, we've sh proved this proposition that the category of Z modules and the category of abelian groups are isomorphic. And so when you hear a statement that's loosely stated like this, the theory of Z modules and the theory of abelian groups, oh, they're the same. Okay, now we, the category theory gives you a precise way of stating what that means. Okay, these categories are, are actually isomorphic. Okay, but as you can kind of see in this example, you can kind of see what's coming... Uh, here, okay. So why this is not a very very strong result, okay? Because really, uh, these two objects, the objects inside here, and and uh, the notion of homs inside here, are so close together, okay? So here, the only thing that's additional is this scalar multiplication, which really comes for free, okay? The multiplication by three really comes for free in this uh, uh, abelian group because you already have addition here, okay? So in this case, this is not a very strong result, and that's why actually in general isomorphisms of categories are very rare. But in the next video, we're going to show a very, very interesting generalization, weakening of this notion to equivalence of categories. And this is something that's very, very special to category theory, unlike in other branches of mathematics. Okay, So it's a peculiarity because you're abstracting already from these abstract things like groups and topological spaces. You're abstracting one f uh, step further back. And so there's this new interesting notion of equivalence of categories. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.